My name is Jim McCloskey, and in 1980, I founded the organization called Centurion. And we work to free innocent people wrongly convicted uh, of uh, doing life or death sentences for the crimes of others. Kate Germond, and I am the executive director of Centurion. When we assess a case, um, we're asking, initially we're asked two questions. Do we believe this person is innocent and who are they? And in the process of determining innocence, we're looking for a case that either has legal, legal avenues that we can pursue to get them exonerated or investigative avenues that we can pursue that would prove that they're innocent. What we do is we reinvestigate the case as if it happened yesterday. We reinvestigate the conviction, who all were involved in the conviction and testifying against or even for the inmate because uh, we're interested in, in understanding both sides of the equation. Could be an alibi witnesses who testified at their trial offering an alibi. Well, we want to test that alibi. How legitimate is it? How authentic is the alibi? And then once it's been determined that a case has this potential, the next question is, who is this person? And because character is very important to us. It's not a science. We like to think that it's somewhat of an art. And as a result, we've developed a process and a procedure that's built on close to 40 years of experience. Centurion receives uh, letters from people literally all over the United States and Canada. And we read and respond to every single letter we get. And what we're looking for is the next great case to take on. We start a correspondence with them. We have a staff, uh, our staff people, who vet these cases along with adult volunteers from the Princeton community. We eventually, over time, we gather the entire written record of the case. Of the 61 people we freed, um, using those cases as empirical data, so to speak, um, from the day we get a letter from them asserting their innocence to the day we actually commit and begin our work to free them, it's usually three to five years, sometimes longer. I was falsely imprisoned at the age of 19 in May of 1994. I was given a total of 60 years in the Texas Department of Corrections for a murder and attempted murder that I had no knowledge of. It's an amazing story. Uh, you talk, if you don't believe in coincidences, then I think you're going to believe in coincidence when you hear how he became a suspect. Numerous pieces of evidence, Brady claims that were not um, disclosed during my jury trial, scientific evidence that was fabricated at the time of my um, trial. As it turned out, because we, we did a timeline, 10 minutes after that shooter disappeared in the neighborhood after exiting the getaway car, Richard Miles was led off by one of his friends to go home. Coerced testimonies of witnesses um, that allegedly said that they saw me do a shooting. Yeah, the police had an APD out for a black male wearing white t-shirt. They saw somebody reported a black male wearing a white t-shirt and the next thing you know the cops swarmed on Richard, handcuffed him and that began his nightmare. We were recommended to Richard by two different people. When I was first incarcerated I would meet a man by the name of Benjamin Spencer which is one of the cases that Centurion has been working on for the longest. Uh, he informed me of an innocence project out of Princeton, New Jersey, one of the few that works on non-DNA cases. But the other person is Joyce Ann Brown. Now, Joyce Ann Brown, we freed her in November of 1989. So Joyce got interested in Richard Miles herself, along with her mother, with Richard's mother, rather. And uh, Joyce came to me and to us, Kate and me, and asked us to take a look at the Richard Miles case. Richard Miles is a tremendous example of not only a great case for actual innocence, but also he is just an extraordinary human being. And that sort of came through in his correspondence. This rose to the top, Richard's case. And so I decided I wanted to go down to meet Richard and to meet his family, his father and his mother. The percentage of men and women that are falsely incarcerated, I believe supersedes what we even think. I hate to get into the percentage 
game because you don't know how many people are innocent until they're exonerated. However, when you consider that the prison population is over 2 million and people bandy about a 2% to 10% prison population um, is actually innocent. But if you consider just 2%, what is that, 44,000? I mean, holy shit, that's extraordinary. I mean, why aren't we doing anything about that? Nobody can really, uh, with any degree of precision, uh, give an, uh, an accurate estimate of how many innocent people are imprisoned in America. I found it very interesting that Dallas, Texas leads the nation in exonerations, um, and primarily because Dallas kept the evidence. Other states, um, after the person um, lost their jury trial and after the courts of appeals deemed that they were actually guilty, they threw away the evidence. So we won't really know what that amount is, but now from what I've experienced, I would say one or probably two in every 10 jury trials, a person is falsely incarcerated because you have so many ways that a person can, can be falsely incarcerated. You have the arresting officers, you have the attorneys, especially if it's a court appointed, court appointed attorney uh, that does not have the resources to adequately defend uh, their client. You have the state's prosecuting team that has a vast amount of resources and, and you cannot negate the jurors because the jurors are supposed to be competent and they uh, we rely on our jurors to take the evidence and take the facts and pull it on a, a scale. So nobody is really immune to wrongful incarceration. And, and that leads to the reason that there are so many people that are incarcerated for crimes that they did not commit. And I don't think society really wants to admit that. I feel safe in saying that there are tens of thousands of innocent men and women in prison in America for crimes they had nothing to do with. I did 15 years from 19 to 34. Uh, that time frame is, is the developmental years of an individual. Uh, and I grew up in, a, in an environment that's, that was not conducive to society, uh, to, to lack of rehabilitative resources in prison, particularly the Texas prison. I'm not privy to knowing uh, other institutions and how they run their prison systems, but Texas in itself, it lacks those uh, core uh, needs that a person needs once they are incarcerated. We can't do anything about a person committing a crime, but once they're in prison, we being taxpayers should hold that institution accountable for assisting them in their transition and not just to house them for free labor. Um, at Centurion, we've always cared deeply about our clients once they're freed. It's taken us a number of years to begin to formulate systems of um, helping these folks. When I was released at the age of 34, I was totally disconnected from society. When I went to prison, it was beepers. When I got out, it was iPhones. When I went to prison, it was no trains in Dallas. And when I got out, trains was everywhere. I oftentimes say that I knew Dallas, I recognized Dallas, but I didn't know it. I recognized my family, but I didn't know them because I had been separated from them. You can't even talk to women in prison, and so there is an emotional disconnect between genders. And, and you get out and you totally feel lost. You feel handicapped, you feel disabled. And so you have to, quote unquote, fake it until you make it. Put this mask on that says, I know what I'm doing, but literally you don't. And it's, 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 it hurts, it's hard. Um, but for perseverance and persistence, we push on coming out of prison. And so uh, an individual faces a lot um, coming out of an institution, even with employment. Part of our process um, is, once these guys are freed, um, is finding them housing. And not all of them have family, in fact, a judge unexpectedly freed one of our guys right from the courtroom. And because he'd been incarcerated for so long, he literally had no family. 
and we had nothing in place for him, and so I brought him home. Once we free them, we are their friends, and we continue to be their advocates to help them in any way we can to get resettled. It's what you do. I mean, if the choice is they have to stay in prison until we can find them housing or I bring them home, obviously I'm going to bring them home. I would meet my, my, my soon-to-be wife a couple of months uh, after my exoneration, um, and eventually a year later I would have a daughter. And so now I've been married four years and I have a two-year-old daughter. And in the midst of all of that, I think me finding my own purpose um, manifested. You know, Miles of Freedom is a nonprofit organization that I started once my exoneration was complete with the monies that the state of Texas allots a person that's falsely incarcerated. Miles of Freedom's mission is to uh, equip, empower, and employ individuals impacted by incarceration, and we provide assistance for the families and communities affected. It, it, it was no other job for me to do because I was in prison. I, I, I started Miles of Freedom not because I'm innocent, but because I was in prison. And I walked the same road that those men and women walk. Uh, when my dad died, I cried on their shoulders. When my grandmother died, I cried on their shoulders. Um, and so the same quote unquote murderers and drug dealers that society refers to these men and women as, these were my friends and associates. And, and if I was empowered to change my life, why can't I change and be a catalyst of change in somebody else's life? And so Miles of Freedom began, and so much like Jim McCluskey and Centurion, you know, we find times in our life when what we want is not as much as what we need. I wanted to do a whole bunch of stuff when I was exonerated. I'm quite sure Jim wanted to do a whole bunch of stuff going to Princeton Seminary Theological Center. But what did he need to do? Where was he most impactful at? He was most impactful assisting in turning this organization into a house for exonerees. I was more impactful assisting individuals coming out of prison, whether you were innocent or guilty, uh, to be that hope, to be that support, to be there when you get out. And, and so a lot of ways we follow the model of Centurion, um, wanting to help people that want to help themselves. I challenge you to meet these folks and not be changed by who they are because they are better than all of us. They are extraordinary. If you are a falsely imprisoned person, never give up. You're gonna write and try and get, you're gonna to write to people asking them to help free you and most people will not even respond to you. I still know people that are in prison that are innocent. And the only thing that I can tell them is to, to have a, a very strong spiritual foundation because law is in man's hands. Most of our people have written hundreds of letters over the years to people asking for help, proclaiming their innocence. 99% don't even respond to them, but they keep on pressing. They never give up. There's such a thing called the persistence of innocence. And that's what Richard Miles had. Richard Miles had persistence of innocence. It doesn't matter how much you um, want freedom. Some people may never get it. And so you have to find that peace inside of you, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that when everything that is tangible tears away from you, you still have that spiritual connection that you know, well, you know what, it's not even about where I am, it's where I'm going. It's what we do right now that's totally dependent on where we're gonna end up. And so that's what I encourage, you know, a person that's innocent in prison, because they may not get out. But if they can be free spiritually, then that supersedes freedom physically. It is so much that I want to say to Centurion, it's so much that I have said, and it's so much that I will continuously uh, say um, to Jim, I would just like to thank him for uh, 
believing in, in, in his self. When everybody probably ostracized him and, 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 and thought he was totally bonkers, he believed in, in the humanity of people. For everybody that's associated with Centurion, and they have to be encouraged that whether they be able to get out 53 more people or whether they continuously to fight and are unable to get out one person, they have to be encouraged that their fight sometimes is better than the win. And we oftentimes fight to win when we just need to fight. And that's what Centurion, they just, they just fight. Hope always remains alive. Never let that candle of hope Keep it flickering, keep it lighted, don't let it go out. And eventually, over time, and unfortunately, it will take a long time, you'll be able to attract the interest of somebody like Centurion and do your best to prepare yourself for the eventuality of your ultimate freedom.